Christ Gospel Church of St. Petersburg, Florida, where Bishop Preston D.H. Leonard is our international presiding bishop and Dr. Tony Young Jr. is our pastor. We are the church where everyone is welcome, where the Bible is the guide and the Holy Ghost is the director. We are delighted you decided to join us today and pray you will be richly blessed by the praise and worship and by the rhema word from the Lord. Please share this link with your family and friends as we prepare to go into our service. May God bless you. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hello, Christ Gospel Church family and friends. To our visitors, our leaders, Bishop Leonard and Dr. Young, and the entire Christ Gospel Church family, welcome you back to another virtual Bible study over here at Christ Gospel. We are so blessed that you have decided to join us tonight. After we worship the Lord, you will hear from our teacher, Pastor Young, with a dynamic lesson. You don't want to miss it. Again, we say thank you for joining us.
Hi, welcome to Christ Gospel Church Bible Study. I'm Pastor Young, and on behalf of Bishop Leonard and myself, we are so excited that you have joined us again for another portion of the Word of God. You know, there's a phrase in the Bible that is very important and at the same time somewhat contentious and confusing to many Christians. Well, tonight I'm going to discuss and study this verse with you. We're just going to study one verse tonight and hopefully we have some time to really dig a little deep to understand the context and the cortex of the Word of God. And if you stay tuned to the end, someone sent me a question, a really good question, about the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. If you stay with us, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end to explore and to explain that question. Let's read our text and then we'll pray and get into our lesson. Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 says, and from the days of John the Baptist unto now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. O oh, gracious Father who art in heaven, we just thank you for this opportunity to come before your people with another slice of the word of God. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. My topic tonight is the violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. So what does this mean? Does this mean that we as Christians supposed to use violence to promote the kingdom of heaven? Do we supposed to use violence to defend ourselves and apologetics and defend our Christian faith? And go after anybody who rejects our beliefs. Now, before we dive into this text, based on commentaries from some of the most brilliant theologians of our time, there are three common views about the meaning of this verse. The first view is Jesus may have been referring to a vast movement toward God. You see the momentum of which began with John's preaching in the wilderness. And we know that John being the forerunner of Jesus Christ. You know, people love the latest fads, the latest shoes, the latest uh, technology. And it was no different back then. People was hearing a fresh new message and they flocked from everywhere. The second view is Jesus may have been reflecting the Jewish activists, their expectations that God's kingdom would come through a violent overthrow of the great Roman Empire. And thirdly, Jesus may have meant that entering God's kingdom takes courage. It takes unwavering faith, determination, and endurance because of the growing opposition leveled at Jesus Christ's followers. There are many other views outside of these three common views. Tonight I want to look at this text through an exegetical lens. In other words, I want to study this text from a critical explanation or interpretation of the text using proper tools. There are many Christians today who use this verse to support their own agenda of violence toward unbelievers. And let me caution you right now that this is not what this verse is about. It's not about going out and attacking anybody and violently cutting them up and down, trying to make yourself look big. It's not about using violence even against our own families or brothers and sisters. One of the chief reasons why the Jews rejected Jesus Christ was because they were looking for a king who would come and overthrow this great, big, powerful Roman Empire, the world's ruling power at that time. In other words, they expected Jesus to take it by force 
or to use violence. But what did Jesus do? After Jesus shows up, he became this great peacemaker. Turn the other cheek. Forgive your enemies. Love your enemies. The Bible says he held his peace. And at one moment, he didn't even offer a murmuring word. So you know what happened? They rejected him. Therefore, even today, many Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come and by force to overthrow this worldly government. But can I tell you this? Yes, Jesus is coming during the second coming. He's coming with force, with judgment. Yes, he's coming with the angels and with the saints after the tribulation period, during the battle of Armageddon, but it will be too late. In order to understand this verse, let's take a closer look at the verses leading up to verse 12. Those of you who have studied with me in Bible study, you know it's very important to know who's writing, who's the audience, and what was happening in the environment at the time in order to truly understand the context. So just allow me to give you a brief uh, backdrop, if you will, leading up to verse 12. John the Baptist have been arrested and thrown in prison and he's awaiting, awaiting his execution. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, John had heard about the great works that Jesus Christ was doing. So he sent two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? In other words, Jesus, they are arresting us. Jesus, if you haven't noticed, they're killing us. They are tormenting us. And we thought you would come and overthrow this sinful, ungodly government. What are you waiting on, Jesus? The clock is ticking. And oh, if you haven't figured out, I only have a few days left to live. Are you the one that we've been looking for, or should we start looking for another? Brothers and sisters, how many of you listening to me tonight have grown impatient with God? It seems like he's not moving fast enough for you. Have you ever wondered or thought, is Jesus really the one or should we look for another? The reason I bring this up is because there are many folk today who have turned their backs and their hearts against Christ. And they have went looking for other gods. But let me just remind you, there is only one way to the Father, Jehovah, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. So John is awaiting his execution. The Jews had been waiting for a long time for a new king to arrive and to stand up and to defend and even destroy this powerful Roman government. You know, back then, the Roman government, they, they were the powerhouse, you know, the precipice of the world. All roads led to Rome. If I can bring it back to 2020, there are many people today who are looking for the next Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, somebody to come and take up their agenda. Someone who will come and deal with all of this craziness, all of this violence, all of this prejudice. But can I tell you, Dr. King was a great man. He was a great activist, but there is a king greater than Dr. King. Oh, he is the king of kings. He is, he is the Lord of lords who, who have set a time through his father's clock that he's going to come back and he's going to make the crooked way straight. Yes, he's going to make the wrongs right again. He's going to he's going to make the darkness bright. So I want you to hold on, my brother, hold on, my sister, just a little while longer. Your season is coming. I wish you would tell somebody sitting close to you 
or text somebody right now, your season is coming. How do you know, Dr. Young? Because Ecclesiastes 3 and 1 says, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 4 and 5, Jesus sends word to tell John's disciples to go tell him what you have heard and what you have seen. He said, go tell John, we've seen the blind. The blinded eyes were opened. We've seen the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The, the deaf can hear and the dead are being raised up and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Wow. He said, go tell John that his purpose as my forerunner has been completed. But now I must do the work that I have been sent here to do. Yes, yes, Jesus, Jesus was not distracted by what John had said. Yes, Jesus was related to John. He was his cousin. John was his forerunner. John baptized him. But even that could not distract Jesus from his purpose. Why did Jesus come to the earth? It wasn't to become rich and famous. No, it wasn't to become a great political leader. But the Bible tells me that he came to save the sinner. Oh, God, help me, Jesus, to heal the sick, to open the blinded eyes, to heal the lame so that they can walk straight, to cleanse the leper. Yes, to raise up the dead and preach the gospel to the poor. That word poor here means those who will humble themselves enough to receive the word of God. Yes, brothers and sisters, Jesus knew his purpose and did not become distracted with the agendas of those around him. What about you today? Are you being distracted with the things that are happening around you today? Are you being distracted and pulled away from your purpose as to why God allowed you to come through time? Are you more focused on all of the crazy violence that's spreading throughout the world? Are you tuned in to every channel and radio station trying to get the latest scoop on the latest violence rather than trying to spread the good news of the kingdom of God? Are you distracted with this election which, by the way, is very, very, very important for all of us to vote. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you who to vote for. Do your research. Seek God. But you need to vote. But let me tell you something about this election. It can become a distraction and it should never replace our passion and purpose for why we were born. Listen, there's no greater purpose in life than accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior and sharing our experience with those around us. Yes, we need to find somebody who cannot see and show them, amen, the word of God. Those who can't walk upright. And the best way to do this is to live by example. Stop talking and start walking. Amen. Now... We can move into the text. Hopefully you have some context. So as we study this verse, it will be relevant and you can apply it properly. Verse 12 says, and from the days of John the Baptist unto now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent taketh it by force. The Greek word for violence is biazo, biazo. It means the kingdom of heaven is under attack by force. Evil is trying to seize or to stop it. There is a full press. Those that uh, watch basketball, you know what I mean when I said a full court press. Usually the defense will go back uh, after half court and they would just do a press, but sometimes when it gets close, they would start at the front of the court, a full court press. 
And this is what was happening. The enemy was doing a full court press against Christians. They was killing, torturing, murdering them. They was trying to confuse the believers with, you know, poison theology, just, just a full court press. This word violence in the Greek, biazo, is the same word that is used in Luke 16, 16. You know, since that time, the kingdom of God is, is preached. John the Baptist and every man press it into it. Yes, Jesus is also saying in verse 12, and from the days of John the Baptist. Now, what does that mean? That is from the days when John the Baptist began to preach in the wilderness that the Messiah is coming. Yes, the Messiah is coming. That was a great rush or a crowd of people pressing to hear this message from John the Baptist. Multitudes came out to hear John preach and as if they were about to take the kingdom of heaven by force. That was just so many people. Listen to what Matthew uh, chapter uh, three uh, verses four through six says. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, when we go back to Luke 16, 16, and said the law and the prophets were until John, since that the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. Brothers and sisters, as you can see, John was seized by mobs of people all over Jerusalem, the city, all over the region of Judea, and all the regions around Jordan came out to hear John preach about the kingdom of heaven. Men have been earnest about learning more about the kingdom of heaven. Yes, they have come. Even now they come pressing to obtain the blessings of God as if they would take it by force, pushing and shoving, trying to get a seat. Oh, brothers and sisters, how I long for the day when people can't wait to get back to the house of God, in the presence of God. They arrive early just to get a good seat, just like a concert or waiting in line for the latest iPhone or sporting event. People will camp out where? All night long to be one of the first to get one of these items. This is how it was in the days of John the Baptist. People would, would get there early pushing and shoving because they didn't have microphones or megaphones. But they wanted to make sure they were close enough to hear this powerful message that John the Baptist was preaching. Pushing and shoving and even being violent with each other just to hear the word of God. Can you imagine people today pushing and shoving to hear the word of God? Are you hungry and thirsty for more of the word of God? The psalmist says, as the deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Jesus himself preaching the Sermon on the Mount says, Happy or blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, before we end this Bible study, before I go to the question and answer period, I want to share a true story with you. In the year of 156 AD, an 86-year-old man was brought before a Roman official and he was asked to renounce his faith in God. They called him an atheist. 
You see, he was not an atheist by our standards, but he was called an atheist because he was a devout Christian. And to the Romans, if he refused to worship the emperor or the gods of the emperor, they considered him an atheist. But Bishop Polycarp, 86-year-old believer in Jesus Christ, he knew that if he did not deny Jesus Christ, it would mean a painful, violent death either being thrown into the arena and torn apart by wild animals or burned alive on a bonfire. He knew the consequences. And three times he was questioned and three times invited to renounce his belief in Jesus Christ. But each time he held on to his faith in Christ. They said, swear that you don't know him. Swear that you don't love him and I'll release you. Just curse Jesus Christ, urged a Roman official. To which Bishop Polycarp replied, 86 years have I served Jesus Christ and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who have saved me? Bishop Polycarp was not spared. A bonfire was built and he was burned alive. Historians tell us that his word echoed through the flames of this fire. They could hear this 86-year-old man saying, 86 years have I served Christ. He has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king? Who have saved me. Brothers and sisters, we must realize that from the days of John the Baptist unto now the kingdom of heaven, it suffered violence and the violent take it by force. This is a twofold meaning for us. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you stand for what the Bible teaches about marriage, one man and one woman, if you stand up and you teach, you know, heaven and hell, you know, holiness, and you teach that, you will suffer violence. Oh, I'm not saying that you'll be burned on a bonfire, but you will be ostracized. You'll be talked about. You'll be scoffed. You'll be laughed at. But only those who are willing to stand, to live and to die for Christ will be able to go back with them when he come. I sure hope you've been blessed in the word today. Now let's get to the question. Someone asked a question and uh, thank you for sending your questions in and I wanna answer that tonight. Someone asked me, what is the difference, Dr. Young, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? What is the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Now. Many people will say, you know, well, they are synonymous, they mean the same, but actually they do have uh, dual meanings. The kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom of heaven is where God lives. And we're going to show you some biblical references to why I am sharing this. Again, the kingdom of God is within the believers. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, the kingdom of God come not with observation, neither shall they say lo here or lo there. Listen to this. Behold, the kingdom of God is where? Is within you. Did y'all see that? Luke. Uh, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. He says, the kingdom of God is within you. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Notice the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven here. And his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. Again, notice these things shall be added unto to you. Yes, kingdom of God is within us. Mark 
10, 24 says, And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Now, we, we have to understand that people were concerned about riches and wealth. And there's a lot of people here, Christians, non-Christians, who are more concerned about the size of their house or what kind of car they drive or the numbers in their bank account than they are with where they're going to live in eternity. But Jesus let them know in heaven we will not have to trust in riches. Huh? In heaven, riches will not be a factor. See, the kingdom of God deals with the power and the spiritual kingdom that Jesus brought here to earth. Yes, we can have the kingdom of God in us now, amen, while we await for the kingdom of heaven. One other caveat I want to add, that there will be an earthly kingdom where Jesus and the saints, the overcomers, were ruled from Jerusalem during the thousand-year millennium. So that is a unique time, but the kingdom of God, when Jesus came, died and rose, he left the kingdom of God here. He said, hey, go wait for the promise. The promise was God was going to restore the kingdom of God to the believers and when the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came, amen, the kingdom of God was relevant again here on the earth. Let's quickly talk about the kingdom of heaven. Now, just like the kingdom of God is within us, the kingdom of heaven is outside of us. It is a place where God lives. Listen to what Jesus said. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Did y'all hear that? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should be not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. Brothers and sisters, we enter into the kingdom of heaven but the kingdom of God enters into us. How did y'all hear that? One day we're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Listen, when, when Jesus' disciples asked them to teach them how to pray, one of the first things Jesus said, he says, I want you to know that our Father who art in heaven. Yes, when Jesus was about to leave his disciples, he says, I go away to prepare a place for you that where I am, we know Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, our Father who art in heaven. And he's saying that he's preparing a place in heaven for the believers that where I am, there you may be also. But in the meantime, there's a kingdom of God that I'm going to leave inside of you. But one day we plan to go to the kingdom of heaven. Listen to Psalms, uh, not Psalms, Matthew 5, 20. He says, but I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about if we don't follow the process of salvation to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, to receive the Holy Spirit, if we don't have the kingdom of God in us, we can forget about trying to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Some of y'all missed that. The keys to the kingdom of heaven is to receive the kingdom of God inside of us through Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 7, 21. He says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Notice he didn't say the kingdom of God but the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my father, oh, y'all missed it. Where is the father? The will of my father, which is in heaven. I, I believe I need to read that again. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Can I give you one more before I let you go? I want to make sure that person that asked the question is getting their money's worth tonight. Matthew 16, 19 says, Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, Peter, I will give thee the keys 
to the kingdom of heaven. Now, please don't miss this. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God, because Jesus left that when he died on the cross through salvation in the Holy Spirit. You got it? But he's telling Peter about something in the future. He said, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatsoever thou shall bind on earth. Talking about when we use the kingdom of God, that's where that's in us. When we use the kingdom of God that is in us, then we have the keys. Some of y'all are going to get this. Then we have the keys that whatsoever we, we do through the kingdom of God within us, Amen. If we bind something on earth, it shall, it has to be, it must be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou loose, loose on the earth, amen, through the kingdom of God in us, it shall be loose in heaven. So in a way, these work together. They work as a strong tandem. Amen. We cannot expect to go to heaven if we don't allow the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ, to dwell in us. Well, that's all the time we have tonight. We hope that you've been blessed with our lesson, The Violent, Take It By Force. If you have questions that you want us to answer, amen, send me an email. That's at TonyBYoung at TampaBay.rr.com. I put it on the screen. TonyBYoung at TampaBay.rr.com. You can send us email and we'll try to do our best to answer some questions and save some time through this Bible study because I believe that Bible study is relevant when you are getting your questions answered. Well, we love you and we appreciate you. We hope to see you soon. On behalf of Bishop Leonard and myself, we say be encouraged, be educated, and be empowered by the love of God. Please stay tuned for our church announcements. I'm walking in power.